everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, like he said, my name is Caitlin Emma. I'm a reporter for Politico. I cover education policy there. Um, we're here to have a great discussion about bridging the skills gap, which is the gap between what employers need and what folks are trained to do and are able to do. So we have a great lineup here of uh, panelists. And I want to start immediately to my uh, left, and I'm not going to mispronounce his name. It's uh, Mark Stodola. He's the mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas, and he's also the president of the National League of Cities. Next to Mark, it's Nicole Isaac. She's the director of public policy and government affairs for LinkedIn. We have Abby Siegel, who's the uh, founder and CEO of Here to Hear, which is an organization that helps um, connect employers and institutions of education uh, and getting them invest, getting them to invest in, I want to make sure I'm describing it right, getting them to invest in a, a diverse, talented pool of youth. And on the end, we have Juke Su, who's uh, the founder and CEO of Coalition for Queens, which is a nonprofit that works to advance economic opportunity through technology. So, I'd love to start talking about the skills gap by uh, sort of addressing the, the, the underlying question of access. Um, you know, part of what feeds into the skills gap is who are we reaching with opportunities in education and are we reaching a diverse pool of talent? So data has shown that there are, you know, racial and gender gaps when it comes to access to STEM and educational opportunities, advanced coursework, and then Separately, we have the whole issue of reaching folks, you know, coming from non-traditional backgrounds, getting them involved. Um, Juke, I'd love to hear from you first uh, about your work with Coalition for Queens, and I know that you're specifically targeted and on this issue of access and diversity and reaching learners from non-traditional backgrounds. Could you talk a little bit about your work there and how you're intentional about diversity and access? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, yeah, for us, we're really thinking about um, the technology sector in particular. You know, technology's created so much wealth and opportunity, um, but at the same time, it's also exacerbated who has access to that and inequalities that exist. Um, there's so much need for technical talent. How do we think about accessing different pools of capital um, and the human capital outside of you know, the elite universities and institutions. And so for us in particular, we're really trying to serve an audience that may not otherwise think about doing this. And we're thinking about diversity and inclusion from a broad variety of ways, uh, ultimately creating a technology community that's reflective of New York City. So it's important for us to be gender balanced. Um, it's important for us to have, represent communities of color, represent immigrants as well. Um, and, um, and then also another dimension we really care about is um, really thinking about those who don't go to college, you know. Um, nearly 70% of Americans don't graduate from college, 7-0. And you think about that, what kind of job opportunities you have if you're a blue collar worker? Maybe a generation ago you can work in manufacturing or um, have a trade. Um, but those opportunities are increasingly disappearing. I think there's a lot of attribution on trade or immigration. But actually, a lot of it is just you know restructuring of our economy, what kind of jobs are available. So we're really trying to be thoughtful about serving that audience of adults um, who may not have gone to college and getting them all the skills, networks, and tools so that they can be employable and work at amazing technology companies. So we have a 10-month program really trying to design to target this specific audience. Um, Incoming to our program, on average, salaries are at $18,000 a year. After the 10 months, we help people get jobs in technology, and average income afterwards about $85,000 a year. So, you know, really thinking about that deep kind of transformation on individuals, um, and yeah, it's 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 really this transformation individual, but ultimately the companies in which people are working as well, because it brings this different perspective to the companies. Um, and you know, if you think about 70% of any pool of talent, that's such a huge number. You know, it's not about the traditional markers of success. So how do we think about identifying that? Um, 
and I feel like I've been really fortunate to have those kind of opportunities. And before this, I was in the military, and the military is all about that too, right? Like literally, the only difference between an officer and a soldier is whether or not you went to college, right? So all the soldiers I ever worked with never went to college, but some of the smartest, hardest working people I ever worked with was from that background, and but they had a structured training, this kind of cultural transformation. So how do we think about that to creating these opportunities for what will be future jobs, which is a lot, I mean, technology is not everything, but a lot of them will be in that. And we should give more people opportunity to that. Does anyone else want to chime in? I mean, how do we make sure that we're reaching a diverse pool of talent? So I'll, I'll jump in here, and thank you very much. This is great to see everyone here. So one of the things that we're really focused on is by the time a young person is 25, we feel strongly they should either be in or very much on the path to a family sustaining job. And if you look at the uh, labor market statistics and what's going to be required by 2020 or even now, 65% of the jobs are going to require some sort of post-secondary credential that's valued by the labor market. And then we compare that to neighborhoods like, this, like the South Bronx where we work, or low-income neighborhoods, neighborhoods that are predominantly of people of color. And in, in the Bronx right now, at best, the number of young people who are going to get that by the time they're 25 is 20 percent. And so there's a significant mismatch in terms of what the labor market is saying it needs, what we know it needs, and then what our institutions, our educational institutions are producing. So from our point of view, it's a real question of like, what do we collectively need to do differently? What do employers need to do differently in terms of how they're sourcing and accessing talent, how their engagement in developing and training talent? What do post-secondary institutions, big public systems like CUNY here in New York, that serve 250,000 degree students and 250,000 non-degree students? And what does a K through 12 system need to do differently? such as in, here in New York City, one in 300 Americans are in New York City public schools. And if you look at that compared to what they're delivering in terms of promise to the students and to the labor market, we have a significant mismatch. So what we're really focused on is what are the levers that are gonna create the institutional change so we have a much better chance at really matching the talent, the incredible talent that's growing up in neighborhoods throughout New York City and throughout the country to the opportunities out there in the future that we all want to have. I would, I would also add that for us it's a question of the ways in which data can help to shed light and transparency into the decisions that employers are making, that individuals are making with their respective decisions, um, the skills that they're investing in, the skills that they're actually training without understanding what the future demand is. And so to the extent that we don't know what those skills and demand are, then we're essentially creating a pipeline of talent that will not be employed tomorrow. And even worse, a pipeline of talent that could unfortunately be displaced given the future of work and given the risks of automation, the shift to gig workers and contractors, as well as just a widening skills gaps. So for us, the, the, the question is, how are you leveraging the power of data and all the information that's available from an employer and educational perspective and complementing existing sources? At LinkedIn, it's, it's really the way in which we're trying to map all of the data on our platform. And, and so when you think about the power of LinkedIn, we have 560 million profiles globally. We have 20 million companies on the platform that are hiring talent. We have 60,000 institutions of higher education. And so to Abby's point, when we know that one in 300 individuals are going to New York City public schools, or that seven million individuals are enrolled in community colleges, we can legitimately partner with community colleges, with the city of New York, with the city of Little Rock, to create more effectiveness and efficiency within the workforce system to ensure that individuals are skilled in the jobs that are most in demand. Most recently, we've been partnering with the National League of Cities to ensure that our data can be useful for purposes of actually giving it to all of these cities to build out their, their labor markets. Well, I'll uh, chime in on this uh, discussion. Uh, at the National League of Cities, as uh, Nicole said, we are working very closely with that data. You know, there's the old adage, and I think I heard it probably at one of these other sessions, uh, trust in God and all other people bring data. So we, 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 we don't uh, have a lot of 
uh, um, a lot of need for the former at the moment, but we do have a need for the data. So, um, and it really helps to guide the, 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 the discussion. But let me, let me just say, I think there's a huge gap here. And uh, the equity divide, the, the racial divide in terms of access uh, to the internet is a, a critical, critical issue. Uh, we see it, I see it as a mayor in the streets, in various neighborhoods, uh, the ability for kids to be able to do their homework or not have the ability to do their homework. Uh, the last uh, presidential administration challenged mayors to um, put uh, uh, internet in all of the public housing units around the country. Uh, they did not provide any money for that either, by the way. They said, you all be creative and find a way to do it. Actually, we did do that in Little Rock. And, and we do have, uh, we do have uh, computer laboratories now in our housing, uh, in our housing facilities. Uh, but I had to go get some secondhand computers from, uh, uh, from the state to be able to outfit those because the HUD office did not have the ability to put computers in. That, that was a glaring example to me of the challenge that we have from a government standpoint to make sure that we're trying to bridge this, this, uh, this equity divide. And it's, it's very, very important. Broadband uh, is a, a critical issue of being able to make sure that we have this available. Um, and I think one other thing I'll throw in there that I thought was very thought provoking, we have a, we have a technology innovation district and we're very proud of what we're doing in, in the technology corridor. And our governor has come out and uh, mandated that, uh, uh, that code, that, that, that teaching coding uh, be done in every high school, in every class, uh, and, and, and every high school. And one of my guys at the tech park said, well, you know, Mark, I think that's probably not very bright. And I, I said, oh, you must be of the other party. And he said, no, that's not what it was. Uh, he said that uh, the, the, the kids of tomorrow, coding is going to be antiquated for the kids that, that are in, in our grade schools right now, most likely. And so the real challenge, I think, is to be able to make sure that kids have the ability to communicate to reason, to think, to have logic. And so I don't think we should forget about those issues as it relates to how we're going to be using these machines in the future. Mayor Stovala, you talked a little bit about you know getting kids connected, uh, making better use of the data. But coming from the president of the National League of Cities and as a mayor, I mean, what can mayors across the country be doing on the ground to address this skills gap or, or how can they better understand their, their local job markets? Well, um, um, this year my focus has been on the future of work and uh, very quickly I put it in three categories. Um, first of all, you've got those uh, opportunity youth or disconnected youth and adults that have dropped out of the system. They're the ones that, that may have very, very good analytical skills but, but for whatever reason they don't have a degree. Uh, and um, and so we really have to connect with them. And largely, they're the ones that cause most of the complications in our communities. If I had to say what group of people would I pick and choose to try and focus on first, it would be trying to make sure that we reach those people and pro provide a way to get them the training for some type of skill and job that will allow them not to go out on the streets and commit crimes and, and, do, and, and sell drugs. Uh, that usually creates an environment that is not inducive for economic development for any city. So that's one bucket. The other bucket is obviously then the, uh, the, the certificating and uh, the skills that we need that are, we're probably still gonna need. Uh, and you know, the, the people that can fix our, our hot water heaters, the people that can do HVAC systems, the welders. Uh, trying to find a finished carpenter uh, is a pretty challenging thing these days. Uh, and all of these aging baby boomers that have these types of skills, there's some very, very valuable jobs. And then finally, of course, then there's the issue of automation artificial intelligence and all of those things and that's the that's the third bucket uh, as a mayor I think uh, and as a city what we do is we we beat the drum we convene uh, we convene uh, roundtables business roundtables we work with our colleges and universities we try to break down those silos uh, in our particular city we've been teaching uh, particular software programs uh, that are necessary for the um, the actually the actual building of, um, of Falcon jets. We have a major Falcon jet uh, facility, the fastest jets in the world. They leave our airport uh, costing 50, 60 million dollars. And finding people that have the training on those computer systems is a, a real challenge. And so what we do is we, we actually teach those courses in our, in our colleges. Uh, we also um, uh, will tell you that um, 
Um, we got a Chinese company recently, and uh, you know they can't find the people that have the, the uh, skills, and so we're taking them to China <laughs> and teaching them over there how, how to deal with the uh, the type of machinery that's necessary uh, for a garment factory that really does not use a sewing machine. Uh, so uh, I think that's what mayors can do is to try and break down these silos, pull people together from the educational system and the business community and really have them talking about what do they need in the future. Well, I'd like to hear from everybody on this, um, but one of the things that I've been most interested in as a, as a reporter, I primarily cover K-12 education, is, is this notion of um, project-based learning that we're seeing so much now in, in schools. I, met with um, several different schools that uh, are really innovative in this space, like uh, late last year, I think it was, and I, you know, for example, I met with a student, um, you know, from Ohio who spends part of his day going to traditional public high school and then leaves and goes and works on building a hydroponic something system in a shipping container. I don't know, it was amazing. And he spent most of his day working on this project, communicating with local businesses and nonprofits and his teammates. And uh, within this project was a curriculum that was tailored to him and built for him by his teachers. So this notion of project-based learning, I feel like, um, is really growing now that we're thinking about how we need to reimagine education so that you know students are equipped with the skills needed for high skilled jobs. So I, I'd love to hear from you know uh, you guys. I mean, what can we be doing to to reimagine education? I guess at the K-12 or post-secondary level, and I don't know if that means re rethinking curriculum or weaving in more work-based learning experiences. But I'd love to hear from you guys on that. Yeah, I, I would actually definitely encourage the increase of more work-based learning systems. And as the mayor said, it would require more colleges and institutions of higher education to work in tandem with the employers. Uh, what we're hearing from our employers are that they can't necessarily find the talent that they need for tomorrow and today's jobs or if they're hiring individuals, they then have to train them in the skills needed for that respective position. That is problematic when we're still at 3.9% unemployment, and when we think about the underemployment levels in this country that aren't sufficiently, sufficiently accounting for the individuals who legitimately should have a job today, but they also can't find those jobs, or they're not eligible and don't have the requisite skill sets. Um, we also have a president who has called for an increase in five, an increase in apprenticeships by five million in the next two and a half years. And I, I think that's a laudable accomplishment and something we should all strive for, but it's going to require employers absolutely committing to increasing the number of work-based learning programs, the number of available apprenticeships, and it's also going to require, again, data when you look at the individuals who are seeking to enroll in an apprenticeship program in Colorado or in Texas or in Michigan or move from Colorado to Michigan to actually access that apprenticeship program, each of the respective states are capturing apprenticeship data differently, such that there's registered apprenticeships that are captured in one space and unregistered apprenticeship programs that are in another space. And so to the extent that we're talking about increasing apprenticeships by five million, I think we have to look to our partners, we have to look to the employers to create it, but we also have to modernize our systems such that we're actually capturing the open and available opportunities for individuals who want them today. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a culture shift um, in many places. One, it's sort of a recognition that we, young people need to be in the workplace. And there's a lot of structural barriers to that right now that just need to be addressed. But if we are going to get to the place where we have young people who are trained for the workplace, they need to get into the workplace. And that needs to start as early as possible with exposure and really understanding what the opportunities are. And then really having the high school experience really connect to work-based learning opportunities and leaving the classroom to learn. I mean, you look at a city like New York City, there's so many opportunities, so much is going on, but given some of the regulations that happen around high school, getting a kid out of the classroom to get to learn is an incredible challenge that principals have to figure out instead of being encouraged. So 
part of it is just modeling how to do it and do it at scale. So one of the things we're doing it here to here is doing it with a network of high schools in the Bronx and pulling those learnings together and then going to DOE and saying, okay, this is what you need to change. Like you can't just talk about seat time. You need to talk about um, portfolio um, projects and learning from that. The other place that really needs to be focused on is, is summer internships. How do we really use summer internships? Not about a way of keeping young people off the streets, um, not just, you know, which is obviously great for the summer. It's also, um, but how do you do it really tied to career pathways and tied to what their interests are? And when it's in ninth and 10th grade, having it so they can try things out for experience and see if they're passionate about it, if they're interested in it, or frankly, if they're not, so they can rule it out. And then maybe by the time they're 11th and 12th grade, they can have a more structured internship with a private employer and really get a sense of, oh, what this is about. And so that by the time they're going to post-secondary, they can make a post-secondary decision that's based on not what they watched on TV and they want to be at CSI, but based on what they've actually experienced by leaving the classroom and what they've actually done, also an understanding of the labor market. And then finally, an understanding of what post-secondary credential they need to be successful in that. Is that a four-year degree, or is it an apprenticeship, or is it a certificate? And then frankly, in the post-secondary space, so many of the young people we're trying to serve are working. So how do we actually marry work and learning much more consistently so we're efficiently using student time? and getting the results that the students want to get and the employers need. And there's just so much that can be done there. Um, the good news is there's a lot of best practice everywhere, but it's a culture shift from this idea that, oh, I'm going to school for the first 20 to 22 years of my life, and then I'm going to work. Because we all know the changes in the labor market. It's actually, we're all going to work and learn. So we need to make sure our institutions, particularly our post-secondary institutions, adapt to create that and that the, our work-based place institutions adapt to do that with them. G.K. The, or Mayor Stone. Uh, I, I was just going to say, uh, you know, the project-based learning is a real interesting model, and the, the issue of scale that you brought up is, is really the challenge, and uh, transportation is a real issue. Um, and some of the real basic issues, we've got a, a program that's really innovative in our school district called Excel, and it's focused in four areas, and they do exactly like you said. Uh, they go to school traditionally until uh, noon, and then they, they go and actually go to the workplace. And so they're going to, ho we've got four categories, four areas, health-related uh, occupations, so they're going to hospitals and working in the hospitals. Uh, they're working in the construction industry. Uh, they're working in the um, uh, public safety area, so they're working in police departments and fire stations and things of that nature. And then ultimately teaching. Uh, we, we, we really are we don't have teachers coming out as fast as as many as we need. So when you begin to think about occupations in the future, you can see that there's obviously need to be some further growth in that. This technology area is really exploding, and I'm sure that there's great opportunities for apprenticeships there that really don't require uh, necessarily the traditional type of education that you're going to get in a, in a full rounded day at, at high school. So uh, I think there's a lot of room for it, but uh, again, uh, the other aspect of it is really making sure that students are aware that there's some great opportunities for a successful job in some of these areas and these occupations. And I don't know that we've done, my school district has done as good a job as we'd like in educating students that there's that option out there. And so uh, that's, a, that's an important element that has to be focused on as well. Um, yeah, I think I agree with everything that's said. Um, <clears throat> Project-based learning is really important, I think. Particularly if, I know you, we talked about the education, the credential gap. Um, I think particularly for those that may not have had those educational opportunities, um, instead of relying on the traditional signals of success, like whatever your college credential is, your GPA is, a portfolio project or these work-based, project-based um, ways of demonstrating skills I think it's a much more powerful way to demonstrate to employers exactly how it fits in and there's a need there. So um, I, think, I think just bringing that angle, it's actually much better for this larger audience that may not have, because like, what is a credential? Yes, it's supposed to be a signal for success in some way or another, but oftentimes those are not 
necessarily capturing the demonstrated skill. So how do we really shift towards demonstrated skill? And I think portfolio and work-based training is, is a way to do that. And I just want to add one more thing. Like I, I strongly believe career-focused education is for everybody. We all work our entire lives, and so it's something that should be embedded in education from the get-go and for all people. So whether you're high achieving, low achieving, whether you're black or white, whether you're rich or poor, everybody should have access to career-focused education and sort of this and developing the essential skills and navigational skills and interpersonal and problem-solving skills that are so critical in this. And I think the more that we talk about career is where we're going. It's not college. College may be a way of getting there. And the more consistently we say it's for everybody, the more likely we'll actually be able to have the institutional change that we need. So getting away um, you know, from uh, the notion of traditional school or post-secondary education, but once we get folks into jobs, um, pet peeve of mine to use sort of these coin terms in education, but I am going to use one now, but like the notion of a lifelong learner, how do we ensure that folks are still learning when they're on the job, still picking up new skills? I mean, what is the best way to do that? And if, if you know this an example in your work, like, love to hear it. I'll jump in, and it's a little bit outside, but I would say one of the things that traditionally we've seen a lot of lifelong learning happening is through unions and through the union um, pathways and, and membership and going on and getting additional skills. And I think one of the challenges we're seeing as there's fewer and fewer uh, union opportunities available and that infrastructure is shrinking, who's going to take the place of that in infrastructure and, and how do sort of community colleges and other post-secondary institutions which are serving this sort of do it in a way that is more closely linked with employers to, to, to sort of fill that vacuum. So that's one place where I think we've seen it and we're certainly seeing it in the healthcare industry um, in 1199. I think you're also seeing it, I, I think you're also seeing it through the increase in online learning programs. I mean, it, we, we acquired lynda.com over three and a half years ago, and it's now LinkedIn Learning comprised with over 13,000 courses on LinkedIn where you can access business, creative, and tech content for any individual who is a LinkedIn member. And that level of online course access is unprecedented and significant in an environment where we're talking about skills gaps and where we're trying to make information more transparent to the individual such that they can fill that respective skills gap and acquire that job that they're seeking. So I, I think you're absolutely seeing an increase in online programs across the board, non-traditional education programs like boot camps and accelerators that are really contributing to an environment where there can be lifelong learning. But I, I agree with you, Caitlin, not to be overly pedantic and trite, I, I think it's important to ensure that we're creating an environment where that lifelong learner can succeed. And that goes to Abby's point around a holistic institutional change where the employers are actually recognizing the contributions that can be filled and that can be can be accounted for with an individual who doesn't have that requisite and traditional credential or that certification. It requires a significant shift. Uh, and I, want, uh, I would add only that, um, first of all, you've got to want to be a lifelong learner. And uh, secondly, uh, the issue of promotion, the issue of greater pay, more pay, uh, the, the, the flat line on many jobs that don't provide an opportunity uh, for improvement or an opportunity to receive more uh, income, I think is a real disincentive. So I think our, our employee, our whole employer employee workforce arrangement with certain kinds of sectors of, of jobs really ought to be re-looked at in terms of how, how we can provide those kinds of incentives, which usually are tied to an additional degree of learning of one fashion or another. Yeah, I think, I think those are good points. Um, and I think that's highlighting actually a distinction I want to make around, I think lifelong learning is really important. I think there's, um, there's lifelong learning of, of someone that keeps getting the skills in that job or kind of that track. But there's, I think there's a more transformative one where you're going from 
a certain role to a much different role, and that's a little bit what we're focused on. So I think like online education and a lot of these opportunities, it's really amazing um, that we can learn anything now, right? And especially with technology, technology is always changing. You have to ca constantly be learning, even as a software engineer. But how do we level people up to even get to those kind of roles? So um, specifically something we've been trying to think about, and again, going back to this blue collar, white collar divide, non-college and college, um, what's going to happen in the future? Another buzzy term they don't like, but I know we're all talking about future of work. You know, with automation, just a technological change, a lot more of these jobs are going to increasingly disappear. So, is there a way that we can transition workers from whether a factory job or driver job to these jobs of the future? So, what we've been thinking about and, and what we've been piloting recently is something specifically designed for that. So you look at a lot of technology companies um, actually have very bifurcated workforces, right? Like, you know, you have drivers and you have software engineers and product managers. Or you have your warehouse and factory workers that are $10, $12 an hour, and then you have your, your software engineers. So we partnered and piloted with two companies, Blue Apron, which is based here. There's a, you know, the food packaging company Right, uh, meals delivery. We think of it as a technology company, but actually, they have 5,000 workers. 90% are warehouse and food packaging workers. Right, non-college hourly wage. In the warehouse, they're uh, you know increasingly restructuring. Those jobs are gonna you know shift, but they still need software engineers. So what we work with them to do was, well, you've hired our graduates. You know, we work with this audience. Why don't we work with you to go into the warehouse? identify who's able to go through this program and become software engineers, they pay us to do that. And so we're taking a food packager, going through the program, at the end of it, we'll be a software engineer at Blue Apron for two years. So thinking about what their employer investment is, and that really transformation from hourly, no benefits, to permanent, well-paid jobs, particularly for companies that are going to continue to shift the composition of their workforce. So I think that those kind of opportunities are really important. And so we're doing that with Blue Apron and also managed by Q, which is we're taking a custodial worker going through. And you know this is a different kind of apprenticeship, because they're still doing their former job. They're learning. And then also, it's a vastly different trajectory. What are those ladders of success in today's workforce anymore? Can you have people go from the mail room working your way up? That's very difficult now, but I think we need employers to think about that and partner with organizations that can do that. $164 billion is spent every year by our by employers on, on training and retraining. And our federal government, through the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act, spends billions of dollars on it and, sure. and, and really in a very disjunctive way. And, uh, you know, a, a real opportunity to refocus those monies in a way that uh, helps for these retraining issues, I think would be really, really important. And uh, it's not happening. I've, I've served on a workforce investment board um, as a, a director of it and executive director of it. And, you know, there, there are all sorts of different models in different cities well, and different states. You see, why, why, why does it work? Why, why does it not work? You know, as a mayor of, you know, Little Rock, you have employers, you have Working with the workforce system, yeah. What's your what's your perspective? Well, the, the, the money the money is the money is uh, first of all, you can either help a lot of people with a little, or you can help a few people with a lot of deep sure. deep training. And sure. and those models vary between cities and 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 districts, even within a state. And there's not enough money, number one, to do the training right. I get a notice every time a major employer lays off individuals and the question is going to be what are they doing or who's going to be doing something to help get them retraining and these are people yep. who've been in usually in a career job for you know quite some time and uh, all I'm saying is I think our, our the money there's a lot of money coming in out of the federal government and I don't think it's being spent very effectively. And, and I would add, just in terms of job centers, we've done a lot of work at the state and local level with job centers, whether through NASWA or NAW, the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, the Nas National Association of State Workforce Boards. And we've really witnessed some of the inefficiencies that exist and the discrepancies that exist at the state and local level. To the mayor's point, I mean, 
unfortunately, the best practices aren't really surfacing up in a way that can be replicated across the board. Uh, there's significant inefficiencies at the local and state level, and you know we're, we're seeing where you have job centers that aren't sufficiently leveraging online technology to track outcomes for individuals accessing jobs and actually putting them into open jobs. And so again, there are opportunities for the federal, state, and local government to come and work in tandem with the private sector such that we can add value to the, the work that's happening at the local level and, and hopefully upskill faster and connect individuals to opportunity faster. And, and I love the story of uh, the, the example of Blue Apron, and that's where I think, to Nicole's point around data, like I think getting much more transparent about this. So if it's known that if you start working in the, in the um, shipping area, Blue Apron, that you could end up in this fantastic job. The more that that's known, that which companies are actually providing these meaningful career pathways, the more people vote with their feet and the more their peers and competitors take note. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do in general with the work is, how, what does it mean to be a work-based learning high school? So if you're a work-based learning high school, this is what it means, and these are our work-based learning high schools. So you as a student, if you go there, you will get this. And then if you are a post-secondary institution that's, a, that's, a, that's focused on work-based learning or here-to-here post-secondary institution, you should connect to this high school because they're already focused on it. But frankly, if you're an employer, you should connect because you know that they're getting X, Y, and Z. And same thing with employers. So I think part of it is getting the best practice codified and out there so people, as they're making decisions, they're informed decisions based on this shared goal that I think everybody, when you step back, has. Well, I want to make sure we get one more question in, um, because I knew our time was going to go by very quickly. But So we've talked about innovation and education and so many wonderful things at the K-12 and post-secondary and after that. Um, but all of that is kind of meaningless if you don't have educational institutions and employers and communities all sort of communicating effectively about what they need and what they can provide. So um, Abby and Nicole, I know at LinkedIn and here to here, you both do a lot of work on ensuring that this communication is more effective. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure, happy to start. Um, so at LinkedIn, as I mentioned, we've been using our data in the aggregate to help cities with workforce development challenges for the last four years. It really started right here in New York City where we partnered with the mayor's office to help build the New York City Tech Talent Pipeline. So leveraging LinkedIn data to support the construction of programs at the community college level and across the board with non-traditional educational programs as he built out $10 million in investments into this tech ecosystem. So what were the skills needed really to, to kind of teach New Yorkers around accessing those jobs that are, that are in demand? We took that model and partnered with the White House under President Obama uh, to work with the Tech Hire program, which started with 35 cities, then 50 cities, then 75 cities, that to your point, Caitlin, really was exemplary of the best practices that could exist at the local level when you bring together employers, educators, government institutions, nonprofits, foundations, and all of the requisite stakeholders within an ecosystem to maximize efficiency, accountability, and effectiveness. Um, I think that model was an important one, and it, it's still something that we've been tracking through our city partnerships, but I think it, it really demonstrates the power of what happens when you bring the right people in the room, as the, the mayor mentioned, because you not only have a commitment from the partners to transform the ecosystem on the ground, but you have more transparency and visibility into what's needed, not just today, but for tomorrow. So when we're talking about the displacement that exists with automation, AI, um, when we're talking about these skills gaps, to the extent that you're able to provide more transparency and visibility into how these challenges are occurring into the sectors that are going to be most impacted, into the populations that could be most displaced, whether it's individuals of color by segment, whether it's middle skill workers or frontline workers, if you have that transparency, then you're better positioned to act and to ensure that you're mitigating that type of displacement. Yeah, 
and I think it's um, it's it's all that, and I think there's sort of the the formal changes that need to be made at institutions to really align around a share, shared goal. So how do you get to by the time a young person's 25, they're either in or very much on the path to a uh, family sustaining career and then saying, okay, what does that mean for me as an employer? What does it me mean for me as a post-secondary institution? What does it mean mean for me as a K through 12? But then I think there's a lot of informal work that just needs to get done that sort of changes the culture on how we do this and sort of don't assume it's gonna happen by somebody else. Like there's a shared accountability whether you're an employer, a post-secondary institution, or a faculty member, or a teacher, or a parent, or a coach. And how do we get that collective, informal partnership and shared accountability to happen in practice? And to me, that's sort of hand-to-hand, -hand, on the ground, place-based strategies of pulling people together and sharing best practice and saying, this is how I did it, how do you do it, and really doing it together. Um, because otherwise we're sort of all working in our separate silos and not getting anywhere. And that's, that's the hard work that takes the leadership of the mayors, of the borough presidents here in New York, of the, the principals, um, just to sort of look up and see who's next to you and say, we've got to figure out how to do this collectively. Well, I think we're about to get the hook. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much for listening to this, uh, this discussion on bridging the skills gap. And please um, give our panelists a, a round of applause.